We'll intervene whenever we decide it's in our national security interest to intervene. And if you don't like it, lump it. The problem with America is not that we go around marauding around the world imposing ourselves. Mm -hmm. The problem with America in the last 10, 15 years since the end of the Cold War, really in the last 60 years, is that we've been too slow to get involved. I don't know how many Iraqi civilians were killed, but I can assure you that the number is the absolute uh, minimal that it's possible uh, in modern warfare. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. Now, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. Welcome to the darkened hour. Welcome to another episode of the darkened hour. I'm your host, Adam Fitzgerald. With me today is a very special guest, James Schwartz, the former Arlington Fire Chief and Incident Commander at the Pentagon. Schwartz retired in 2021 after serving five years as the Deputy County Manager for Public Safety and Technology in Arlington, Virginia. Prior to that, he served in the Arlington County Fire Department for 32 years, the last 11 as Chief of Department. The Arlington County Fire Department was the lead agency for the response to the September 11, 2001 attack at the Pentagon. Chief Schwartz led the unified command effort for the Pentagon incident. Currently, he is a senior fellow with the program on crisis leadership in the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and teaches in the executive education programs, including Leadership in Crisis, the General and Flag Officer Homeland Security Executive Seminar, and Leadership in Homeland Security. He provides frequent lectures on crisis leadership for organizations such as the U.S. State Department, the FBI, several universities, and numerous international audiences. He also lectured as part of the Joint Counterterrorism Awareness Workshop Series on a complex coordinated attack preparedness program by FEMA from 2014 to 2018. He is also a member of the International Association of Fire Chiefs Committee on Terrorism and Homeland Security, which he chaired from 2008 until August of 2014. He previously served on the Advisory Council for the Interagency Threat Assessment and Coordination Group and, subsequently, the Joint Counterterrorism Assessment Team at the National Counterterrorism Center. He also served on the Homeland Security Science and Technology Advisory Committee and was a member of the Advisory Committee for the Department of Homeland Security in 2010. Very pleased to have you here, Mr. Schwartz. Thanks for the opportunity, Adam. Glad to sure. be here. Sure. Now, uh, I'll, my initial question is, I, like I said, I've interviewed many people connected to the investigation of the events of September 11th. Um, but you're the first person I've interviewed where you were actually at the crime scene on the day itself. Can you describe for us what the morning hours were like for you before Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon? Well, so back uh, during that time, my uh, wife and I had a routine. We had two young children at the time. Uh, they're both grown adults now, but um, two young children. And we had a routine uh, pretty much every weekday, at least when I was in town. I would go to work very early, uh, go to my office uh, at the fire department. She would get the kids off to daycare and school and then um, head to work herself. And then in the evening, um, I would get out, pick up the kids, you know, get dinner together and, you know, be ready for a, a sort of a family evening. So um, I'm in my office on the morning of September 11th, and my wife actually calls as she is driving uh, to work. And she says, the news is reporting an airplane into the World Trade Center, has flown into the World Trade Center. I turned on the television in my office and began to absorb the images that um, many people were waking up to that morning. The North Tower had already been hit. Um, as I looked at those images, based in part because of the investment that we had made in terrorism preparedness, harking all the way back to the early 90s, we had watched the World Trade Center bombing, the first World Trade Center bombing, 
Oklahoma City bombing in 95. Um, we paid a lot of attention to the sarin attack and the Tokyo subway mm. also in 1995. Mm. So we were already beginning to think about, um, you know, what terrorism might add to our mission, you know, the, the, the kinds of preparations that we would need to make. So when I looked at the North Tower, um, I immediately thought it was an intentional act. The silhouette of the airplane, mm. uh, a whole silhouette of the airplane on the side of the tower, just spoke to me about a lack of an attempt by the pilot to avoid the building, which if there'd been a mechanical difficulty or just the, the odds of it having a, a, a straight on strike just didn't make much sense to me. Um, so I started thinking immediately that it was an intentional act uh, and of course, a short time after beginning to watch, the South Tower was struck, which just confirmed um, my beliefs. Um, I got on the phone and called our communication center, um, talked to the ECC administrator and said, um, I want all of our units that are not assigned to incidents back in quarters. I want them all to return. In the, you know, on a typical day in most fire departments, um, we are out doing uh, public education demonstrations, we're doing physical fitness, we're doing training, all sorts of activities. Mm -hmm. And I wanted everybody back in their normal response areas because I was already thinking that with a second airplane, if this was more widespread, the seat of our national government in the DC area certainly would seem like a likely next target. Right. Um, and so, um, you know, the radio call went out. Interestingly, I got a phone call a few minutes later from the emergency communication center. And they asked me, um, they said, we're getting telephone calls from uh, occupants of high rise buildings. And they were very specific about uh, one building in particular, which back in 2001, the headquarters of the USA Today newspaper was in Arlington and their mm. building was right along the Potomac River along the final flight path of approach for airplanes coming from the north to land at National Airport. People in that building were watching the images on television and began to wonder if they were at risk, if airplanes could fly into their high rise building. So they called our 911 center and asked the question, the 911 center called me and I said, I don't have anything to offer. I, there's nothing I can tell them other than if they feel unsafe, leave the building. Hmm. Interestingly, a few minutes later, a call for an activated fire alarm was dispatched at the USA Today building. We suspected that somebody, when they were told to leave the building, decided to pull the fire alarm to alert other people. Um, and so there was a response that was actually generated, uh, you know, put in mo put units in motion going to this activated um, alarm call. About that same time, engine 101 uh, was traveling up Interstate 395. This is the roadway that if you traveled all the way to the end, um, you would hit the 14th Street Bridge, which is what connects, Arl connects Arlington to the District of Columbia. Uh, Captain Steve McCoy was in charge of that unit that day, and his engine saw Flight 77 go down. They, they, they watched the airplane cross their windshield. They lost it uh, where the horizon, you know, where the, the plane went down on the other side of the horizon. But Captain McCoy reported an airplane going down in the vicinity of the 14th Street Bridge. The Pentagon is just to the southwest uh, of the 14th Street Bridge. And soon after that, radio calls began coming in. The 911 center started getting calls um, about, you know, an airplane down, fire, smoke, just all sorts of things that you would expect um, as our awareness of what was going on began to unfold. Most of what I'm asking you today will be based off the book, Firefight, The Race to Save the Pentagon by Patrick Reed, which you helped to author. Now, okay, you get the call, you arrive at the Pentagon, and when you get there, 
what struck out at you the most and what did you want to establish immediately upon arrival? Well, what struck me most, I mean, there's a gash in the side of the building. Now, how big big was the gash, by the way? So the gash, um, I I don't have the exact measurements, but it was certainly a large enough gash that um, it was clear something had penetrated it and it wasn't something small. In other words, some people initially thought that perhaps it was a uh, small airplane, a small mm. you know, private aircraft. It, it clearly was much larger than that. And just to set a little bit of context, the Pentagon, which is five concentric rings, um, still today, one of the world's largest office buildings, 17 and a half miles of hallway in that building. The center court area um, in the middle of those, uh, of the A ring, the very uh, innermost portion is five acres in size. Mm. So this is not an insubstantial building. And um, because it was built, um, you know, back, um, during the World War, the effort to mobilize for World War II, um, there's not much steel in the building, not much at all. It's all concrete and limestone. So there's a gash in the building that is quite substantial. There is fire and smoke that is hundreds of feet in the air. Mm. Um, on a normal day, there are roughly 25,000 people that work in the building. Um, September 11th was not exactly a normal day by that measure because the portion where the airplane struck was largely unoccupied. Um, The Pentagon was undergoing its first ever renovation. It was going to be done in stages and the first stage was proximate to where the airplane went in and it was all but unoccupied. And so that's what accounts for um, the relatively low number of casualties, every one of them precious, obviously, to the families who lost loved ones, but 184 um, people in a building that contained 25,000 was a combination of luck, I would say, um, you know, where the airplane struck and the fact that it had gone anywhere else, the building would have been much more um, richly occupied. There are um, hundreds, if not thousands of people streaming out of the building. Uh, it won't surprise people to know that, again, the headquarters of our military, um, both uniformed and civilian members um, of the Department of Defense are doing everything that they can uh, heroically to not only care for the people who've made their way, made their way out of the building, but to go back in the building repeatedly to try and do what they can, um, you know, to help their their comrades uh, that might still be stuck in the building. So it's a mass of people. It's a it's a chaotic scene, so to speak. Right. Um, scale wise, obviously extraordinary. Um, but our role typically when we go to the scene of an emergency is to take those elements of chaos and begin to smooth them out Mm. by um, applying our incident management system, um, by coming up with a strategy to deal with the incident, prioritize where we're gonna put our resources. And so that's that's really what I started to do in those first minutes. Now, you, you mentioned that there was a problem of Pentagon personnel entering the scene of impact, make it a very highly dangerous situation for everybody around. Did you establish a perimeter where you wanted to uh, consolidate uh, personnel by ID uh, um, or in units and whatnot? No, we, so the, the way that the incident command system, ICS, works um, is that, you know, there, there is one decision maker or set of decision makers in our mm-hmm. case, unified command. And what we're essentially doing is breaking the incident down into manageable pieces. And we do that either by geography or by function. Hmm. So I did establish um, 
divisions based on geography, based on areas that I would then assign resources to. Um, but those resources were often a mix of different agencies. Um, we have a very regionalized system in the Washington metropolitan area where in Northern Virginia, as an example, the jurisdictional boundaries don't mean anything. We just, we share resources based on who's closest to an incident. Mm -hmm. And so that is, that's a very mature system that had been operating for even for decades on September 11, 2001. So we know each other, we know what to expect each other from each other. We have, we have interoperable communications. And so it's really a matter of, um, you know, figuring out, again, as I said before, how to prioritize our most important tasks and then apply the available resources to those priorities. Mm. No perimeter was established. Um, it, I, did, I did establish a perimeter. In fact, our first request, our first logistical request was for 2000 feet of six foot chain link fence so that we could create a barrier and access points. Right. But that, but that took a couple of hours to establish, you know, to get that resource, to get it in place, um, to get people assigned. Um, the FBI was initially going to uh, create a badging center, but all of their resources got deployed to New York. Mm -hmm. And so the Secret Service um, arrived and established a badging operation. Initially, we, we handed out wristbands and the wristbands would simply give us a quick visual signal as to who was legitimate and um, authorized to be, you know, in the work area. Right. Sure. You, um, you, you mentioned in an interview that I, I, I watched uh, about two or three years ago, where the FBI in 1998 wanted to work with the fire departments and EMS and even attended regional meetings. Can you explain how important this was for September 11, 2001 at the Pentagon? Yeah, yeah. So this was um, this was a particular special agent, Chris Combs, yes. uh, assigned to the Washington Field Office. He had studied the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. He'd gotten very close to the chief of poli the police chief uh, in Oklahoma City, who had that experience. And what um, Agent Combs came away with uh, from that study, from that that you know um, deep dive. Uh, attempt to understand how to manage that kind of an incident. What he came away with was this recognition that the partnership that the Bureau, the FBI, has with local law enforcement, absolutely essential. But um, when you're dealing with an incident like Oklahoma City or September 11th at the Pentagon, he, he recognized that the people that the Bureau was first going to be standing next to was the local fire and rescue mm -hmm. service. And so in 1998, Chris and his squad began um, showing up at the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments Fire Chiefs meeting. We, we, we have a, an organization in the metropolitan area called COG, the Council of Governments. Mm -hmm. um, it is all of the local jurisdictions that come together to work on those issues that are not um, bounded by a, by, by a jurisdictional line. So think um, air quality, yeah. um, think uh, economic development. And actually the, the uh, issue that gave rise to COG in 1957 was the local police chiefs wanted to know how they might work together to provide each other with mutual aid. And over the decades, COG has grown into a very substantial organization. There's a police chiefs committee and a couple, about a dozen subcommittees. There's a fire chiefs committee and about a dozen subcommittees that work on technical issues. Chris and his squad started showing up at the fire chiefs meetings and at those technical subcommittee meetings. Um, to get acquainted, to share information, to gain a mutual understanding. Uh, in fact, on September 8th, three days before um, the, the attack on the Pentagon, Chris and our respective organizations were at a large scale field exercise that had been hosted 
by Fairfax County. Um, the scenario happened to be the release of a chemical agent, um, but all of the fire and police departments from Northern Virginia, Chris's squad from the FBI, um, all participated in an exercise. And while it was a simulation, the resources, the methods of communications, the information sharing, the unified incident management um, were all exactly what we did on September 11th. So the, the ability to know each other, to gain some awareness of who each other are and what they bring to the problem set um, was just made extraordinarily easier by way of those relationships um, that had begun, you know, from Chris's, you know, what Chris learned and took away from his study of the Oklahoma City bombing three years earlier. Uh, interestingly enough, this wasn't a question of, uh, you bring up uh, projects. In uh, October of 2000, there was a, um, um, a, a project called the Moscow, which is the Pentagon Mass Casualty Project. Did that involve, um, Anyone from the fire department or uh, local agencies at all? Yes, we, um, so here's the thing. The Pentagon doesn't have its own fire department. It relies right. on Arlington County. Um, Arlington County Fire Department goes to the Pentagon almost every day. Um, some of the largest fires before 9-11 that I'd ever been mm. to in my career were at the Pentagon. Yeah. Um, and... So the Pentagon, you know, sort of incorporated us into a lot of their um, work. Um, in nine, coming out of the study of the sarin attack in Tokyo, the National Capital Region, the Washington metropolitan area, created um, a specialized team of responders, doctors, and nurses that were specially trained and equipped to deal with incidents involving weapons of mass destruction. And the Pentagon uh, Defense Protective Service, what was the police department back then, uh, participated on that team. So John Jester, who was the chief of the Defense Protective Service, knew yeah. us well. Um, you know, so there was uh, a, a constant working together in exercises, um, you know, planning efforts, uh, just, you know, a recognition about how important, again, another relationship was. You, you mentioned about the fires. Now, when you get there, I mean, the fires were enormous, according to numerous testimonies there. And it spread along the roof line. But um, it was contained, I think, by mid-afternoon the next day, I want to say, but with smaller pockets of fires yet to be extinguished. And the firemen had to make holes on the vents of the rooftop to try to spread to the other areas of the Pentagon, because if I'm right, I heard that the roof line was made of horsehair, I wanna say, um, would that be right? How many fire departments were involved in fighting the fire? Um, you know, that's a, that's a good question. I, I don't have an exact number in part because um, we had uh, some unfortunate self-dispatching um, departments that were not requested, but arrived, showed up, uh, oh. engaged anyway. But I think it's safe to say that a combination of what is in the normal regional system that we um, use resources from, and, and again, those people who decided to come um, uninvited, so to speak, um, I would say that there were close to two dozen fire departments. Yeah, there was, there was a lot. Yeah. There was a lot. yeah. Now, the, the, what were the, what was the, uh, the main part, where was the main location of the, the biggest fires at the Pentagon? So when Flight 77 um, hits the west side of the building, it penetrates the outer three rings. Right. So the E ring, the D ring, and the C ring. In fact, on the inner wall, meaning closest to the center court, um, there is a rather symmetrical hole that is opened up yes. in the C ring wall mm -hmm. where um, the force of the airplane, the destruction that it is causing um, essentially comes to rest. And the jet fuel that is injected uh, into the building um, 
creates a fire that is pretty much um, all five floors uh, in the building in that area. Um, we actually do have this diagrammed out uh, in our after action report and the Pentagon did the mm. same thing there uh, in their historical um, uh, analysis of the event. They mapped out the, you know, through, um, uh, you know, mapping tools uh, exactly what the space was. The, the fire on the inside of the building was largely under control by the early evening hours of September 11th. And you mentioned the horsehair insulation. This was something that I was, I did not know existed. Um, and it was underneath the slate deck that covered the A ring, the E ring, and the corridors that run perpendicular. Uh, and that's, the fire got into that area overnight on the 11th. And we went back in the early morning hours to gain, to, to extinguish that fire. Right. Now, um, when you get there also, you assigned Arlington Battalion Chief Bob Cornwall to lead the search and rescue operations. Can you describe for us, what are the primary functions of a search and rescue at the Pentagon and who else insisted in this uh, endeavor? So life safety is, the um, undeniable priority mm -hmm. um, for our work. And oftentimes um, other tactics are necessary to enable effective search and rescue. So as an example, sometimes we have to get fire out of the way in order to get in mm -hmm. and do search and rescue. But what I was essentially asking Bob to do was um, I assigned him companies, uh, in other words, groups of firefighters who were obviously trained and equipped. Um, I, I should back up a little bit and say that um, Bob at the time um, was a very tenured member of the department. Yeah. He had spent a good deal of his career in the Crystal City, Pentagon City area. Um, in fact, he'd been the station commander at station five, The the closest firehouse to number to the to the Pentagon. He'd been to the Pentagon more than anybody. Mm -hmm. um, on September 11th, Bob was actually back his first day after being off for quite some time to get treatment for cancer. Um, he still didn't have his hair back from his chemotherapy, um, but he was in it. He, I mean, yeah. uh, and so I assigned him companies. I directed him to the area that I wanted him to begin. Um, the search and rescue effort. And um, unfortunately, uh, before that could actually be effectively mounted, um, we had a report of a second airplane uh, yes. headed our way. And so that, that initial uh, attempt to do search and rescue um, got delayed somewhat. Um, was the report to the second plane uh, alluded to Flight 93 or was this a, another now, this was the first report of, of another airplane, and this right. was late 93. Right. This right. is the FBI's uh, FBI headquarters radios to the Washington field office um, that they, at one point, they told us there were eight aircraft that were unaccounted for. Yeah. And that this particular aircraft they believed was, believed was headed our way and that they estimated it to be 20 minutes out. Um, and so we made a determination to evacuate the incident scene um, thinking that if it was an airplane, I mean, we, again, as I said earlier, watching the second airplane go into the World Trade Center made clear in my mind that uh, not only were airplanes the, the tool, the method of mm -hmm. attack, but the attack was coming in waves. And so why would a second airplane not be coming to the Pentagon sure. as it had been at the World Trade Center? You also had to you had to deal with the uh, the collapse of the building of the Pentagon as well, and you're I, I'm I'm going to assume uh, that your immediate reaction is to shore up whatever parts of the Pentagon that needed to be uh, secured. Um, who were the primary members involved with that? So um, the shoring, you know, that what 
it's it's more a matter of dismantling the collapse pile okay um, in in a in a slightly different kind of search and rescue effort when when i assigned chief cornwell and fire companies to begin search and rescue um, a short time after we arrived on september 11th that was a kind of search and rescue in which they are going in um, with protective clothing, with breathing apparatus, and they are searching in the smoke and fire um, for victims, um, you know, to be either pulled or to be led out of, um, of those circumstances. Once the fire is out and, and the collapse has occurred, which actually occurred right before, about 15 minutes before the report of the second airline, um, once the, then once the fire is out, we need to start dismantling this pile in the hopes of finding people who might be trapped. So it's a different kind of search and rescue. And it's a very meticulous, um, only the people who are specially trained in collapse rescue do this kind of work. Arlington County had a, still today has a technical rescue team um, with uh, members that are specially trained to do this kind of work. They combine with our brothers and sisters in the Alexandria mm -hmm. Fire Department who also have a technical rescue team. And they were the initial um, uh, responders assigned to begin to dismantle that pile. But I had also on, the, on September 11th, called for urban search and rescue teams. The Federal Emergency Management Agency has um, 27 urban search and rescue teams that are dispersed across the country. These are teams also specially trained in technical rescue. The difference is that they are local responders, but they are supported financially by FEMA. Right. So the federal government uh, essentially, essentially provides for their resources in return for them being essentially dispatched by FEMA. And so I made a request for urban search and rescue teams. Initially, I wanted two, um, and I knew that I would be getting the team from Fairfax County and the team from Montgomery County, Maryland, part mm -hmm. of our, you know, in our regional area. Um, and then Following that, we got three additional teams, one from uh, the Virginia Beach area, one from um, Memphis, Tennessee, and one from New Mexico. It was a huge, uh, there was so many people involved. I think at this, uh, from what I've heard, it's the largest investigation in Washington, D.C. history at the Pentagon. Uh, just to, if, would that be right? To, this to that point, point. Yeah. to that point. To that, point. Yeah. That, that, and, and that may have been eclipsed by more recent events. You know, during the cleanup phase, you had you had units working on the Pentagon interior damage debris, and then you had one that was working on plane debris, and these are two piles. Uh, where were these areas, and who was in charge of identifying the, the plane debris? So um, debris is evidence. Um, there was lots of evidence to be collected. Mm. The FBI, um, and this goes all the way back to uh, a presidential directive from President Clinton in 1995, I believe, 96 maybe, that designates the FBI as the lead law enforcement agency for all acts of terrorism in the United States. And what that means is that under normal circumstances, it would be local law enforcement who would take the lead um, in investigating a crime of which collecting evidence is a crucial part. And they, when necessary, would ask for assistance from the FBI. In this case, that is reversed and the Bureau has the lead responsibilities, although they are incorporating members of the Arlington County Police Department, the Alexandria Police Department, the Fairfax County Police Department into that evidence collection effort along with other federal law enforcement agencies. And so there were airplane parts, um, not a lot of them because there's not a lot of the airplane left, but there right. are pieces of the skin of the airplane that have essentially peeled off as it struck the building mm -hmm. and are laying on the west lawn of the Pentagon. 
the FBI makes an immediate effort to start collecting those up and they put them in a designated area, uh, again, on the west side, because evidence not only needs to be preserved, its integrity needs to be maintained, sure. meaning the chain of the chain of evidence. So that those airplane parts went to a designated area established by the FBI, and then were under 24 hour a day guard. Okay. So that they could not be tampered with. The, um, the, the airplane parts are obviously evidence, but they're not just evidence for the Bureau at this stage. Um, they are also evidence for the National Transportation Safety Board who works very closely with the FBI, their protocols are well known, both each agency's protocols are well known to each other. And so the, par the airplane parts that are initially collected from the ground on the west side are placed in that area. And then subsequent parts of the airplane, which are found as we dismantle that collapsed pile, right? As we, as we take apart that pile, more evidence is revealed. Most of that evidence is the remains of victims, but it is also additional parts of the airplane. Sure. And again, um, all under the protocols of the Bureau for collecting evidence, the rescue technicians would, would come across evidence. At a certain point, um, they would call the Bureau's evidence team into where they were working the Bureau would process the evidence and then take it out of the building to, if it was airplane parts, it was where that designated area was. If it was a different kind of evidence right. separate from victim remains, it would go to another area that again, the FBI controlled. And then if it was human remains, it would go to the temporary morgue that was established on site. Um, it, it, during the book, I learned the, the person who ran the morgue was Tara Bloch from the FBI, I believe. And also when they were identifying, this is something new to me, um, when they were identifying uh, human remains or parts, but they would put color-coded flags. Um, are you, were you aware of that? Is that right? Or yes, did I no, that, that was the, 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 the uh, rescue technicians, again, as they're dismantling, they're not gonna stop their work each time they find a discrete piece of evidence. Sure. What they do instead is they drop a flag where that evidence is and then they work then they continue to work and then at a certain point there's enough for the evidence technicians to do if they come in because remember we're still working against the clock here we're still hopeful to find live victims sure and so the idea is to drop a flag where the rescue technician sees the evidence but then continue to work without disrupting that evidence right and then there might be you know two or three dozen flags dropped at a point that the rescue technicians say, okay, well, this is only hindering our work now. Let's get the, let's get the evidence teams in. They would come in, examine all of those areas, document the evidence, process it, and then, um, and then the rescue technicians would go back to work. Another surreal part of your uh, experience there um, was that, let me be a little bit technical, all right? Flight 77 was holding 11,300 gallons of jet fuel, which equals amount to about approximately 75,000 pounds. You had a number of jet fuel burn victims, and you also had a number of victims in the Pentagon um, who died without any superficial injuries, but were later described as victims of asphyxiation. Can you describe what happened to these victims and why they died from asphyxiation? Well, I, I'm not a medical examiner, obviously, right, right, right. Or medical authority, but, I, but I, what I would tell you is there, there are two things um, that uh, contributed to those deaths um, in that way. One is obviously the fire has consumed the oxygen mm -hmm. um, in, in, in the area that many of those victims were. And so you know, we talk about in, in the profession, we talk about the products of combustion. So there is a lot that is burning that a human being cannot breathe um, effectively. So their asphyxiation likely came from a combination of those products of combustion and a lack of clean air or oxygen. 
And then there were also people who expired as a result of the concussive effect of essentially the explosion. When the airplane hits the building, there is a shock wave that goes through and some of the victims are actually killed by the shock wave. Interestingly enough, you, you did mention the Arlington After Action Report, which I'm going to actually link in the description box because I want people to read that. Now, according to the report, the interior west wing of the Pentagon had a noxious odor of jet fuel. Uh, there was fallen electrical lines. You had the corpses of victims. It's smoke and other gases on top of this. You also had a damage to weakened first floor of the west wing. This made it not only a structural hazard, but it was also a chemical hazard that many people don't appreciate. Air monitoring and decontamination operations, uh, they began shortly after the arrival of the uh, NMRT task force, which set up like medical tents and corridors. Uh, what was it like to work in these conditions? Well, um, it was horrific for um, what we were visually exposed to. I mean, the victims, um, you know, some were relatively intact, many unfortunately uh, were not. So, you know, that was a, um, a stress that we constantly monitored uh, among our responders. Mm -hmm. But then there was also, um, you know, <laughs> In this area in September, it can still be pretty warm. Sure. And so um, the, and on top of that, the fire in the Pentagon, a lot of the heat was still contained within the structure. People had to work in Tyvek or other kinds of protective clothing. Um, so it made for, um, you know, quite some, difficult from a physiological standpoint, the, the mm -hmm. heat and the conditions that people had to work in. But we recognized very early on that um, the products of combustion, the jet fuel, uh, who knows what else um, by way of exposure, hazardous materials exposure, we needed to protect everybody operating in that area. And so Initially, as I stated earlier, people, when we were still fighting fire, were wearing self-contained breathing apparatus. But as the fire was put out and we changed the phase, you know, to more of the uh, urban search and rescue, we still required everybody to wear approved respirators. Mm -hmm. Because as we are finding out most um, graphically from the number of people in New York that have perished of occupational diseases associated with their working on the pile in New York, that number is soon to eclipse the number of responders that died in the actual collapse in New York. In, at the Pentagon, thankfully, we've only lost two responders, one police and one fire. The fire loss was actually Battalion Chief Bob Cornwell. Um, that you mentioned earlier. And the FBI has lost between New York and the Pentagon, um, I think their number now is 18 agents that worked either the Pentagon or New York and have succumbed uh, as a result of their work. So we were trying to hedge against exposure to what we very clearly understood to be hazardous materials. We have a hazardous materials team. We've dealt with this stuff for these kinds of things for decades. Um, and so the, the idea of personal protective equipment, including respirators and decontaminating people as they came out of the site and taking off their uh, garments that were exposed was something that um, we paid rigorous attention to. Sure. We also did air monitoring. Um, we had a number of agencies with expertise. Uh, Arlington County assigned our safety officer, Captain Bob Swarthout, um, at the time to manage those uh, air collection efforts. 
and then to analyze the data so that we could regularly understand what the hazards were and whether or not adjustments to PPE, to personal protective equipment should be made. Sure. I, I, I wanna make it clear for the listener who is not familiar with the Pentagon design outlet. Now, the punch out hole, the exit hole that you mentioned was located on a and &E Drive. And it is said that the items were covered there were even uh, from the book that human feet were in shoes, parts of landing gear, some fuselage. And, ex and also Patrick Clee made it clear that when the plane impacted the building, the explosions, as you said earlier, sent shockwaves down the hallways, straight through the ceiling and exiting the context, making the hole. Now the yeah. plane impact tore through, at, while it was going through, tore a bank of administrative offices in the E-ring where the army, the army occupied. Then it destroyed the Navy Command Center, which extended from the D-ring to C-ring, and then to the Defense Intelligence Office on the C-ring, where the debris plowed through uh, the building while this is going through, causing a diagonal field of destruction that tapered like a dagger. Um, were, where was this? It is said that the Naval Command Office uh, suffered the most casualties, right? Is, is, would that be right? That is correct. That is correct. That is correct. And just, you know, back to, to our earlier um, discussion about parts of the airplane, it is just inside that wall at the sea ring right. that the landing gear um, and the black boxes, which are not black, uh, from the airplane were found. Um, so, all, so that those the landing gear being among, along with the engines, being among the heaviest uh, uh, articles, you know, associated with an aircraft with an airframe. Um, those, you know, again, just think of the physics. Those sure. because we've got the most weight are pushing the furthest into the building. Um, and so it is, you know, some of that landing gear, as well as the, the black boxes that are discovered right in, just inside that uh, C-ring wall. Yeah, that and that was on the inside, not on the outside of the Correct. main drive, right? right. Because right. when there's pictures uh, showing the, de the, the hole, as well as this uh, parts of the landing gear on the outside, but what it doesn't show is on the inside of that wall is Correct. where a lot of the plane was resting. Exactly, yeah. Um, you mentioned, oh, by the way, I'm glad you brought this up. You mentioned the black boxes, and I believe they were found on September 14th. Correct. And they were found by two individuals. I want to, I want to see if I can remember my name, uh, Carlton Burkhammer and Brian Moravitz. I think those are the two people that were found. And, and Dick Bridges, who was the deputy manager for Arlington, stated that they were found located near, as you say, near the impact point where the majority of the debris was. When this was found, uh, who is in charge of transcribing the data and collecting the black boxes? And what did they manage to, to transcribe with? So um, I don't know all of the people downstream that are associated with um, the black boxes, but again, because in this case, they are primarily evidence, the FBI took possession of them. Okay. All right. Now, what we were later informed, we hadn't even left the incident scene yet, but we were told that um, no information was recoverable from those boxes, uh, in part because of the conditions that they essentially laid in for three days. Um, they're built to withstand the crash of an airplane, but they are not with, they don't, I, if I remember correctly, it is fire and uh, there may be something else that they're not great at withstanding. Right. Uh, and so what we were informed of, um, I, my recollection before we even left the site was that they, there wasn't, there was no data to recover from the right. boxes. All right, uh, just uh, the, co the cockpit voice recorder was destroyed and the, the, vo the, the, um, the flight data recorder, they actually, uh, recovered uh, data from it. Okay. Um, uh, that's what I, I that's what I was I was learned of, um, and I got that from the National Transportation Safety Board. Um, that could be. Well, I just mixed up the two. Yeah. No, that's uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I want to mention Major General James Jackson, the commanding general for the Military District of Washington, who is actually your conduit 
from the Department of Defense. What what role specifically did Jackson play here, and how important was it to you? So um, Jim Jackson, uh, as you said, was the commanding general for the Military District of Washington, um, of which the Pentagon is not a part. The Pentagon is its own reservation. It is not a part of right. the Army has responsibilities for uh, managing the building, but it is not part of the Military District of Washington. However, um, other than, as I was alluding to before, people like John Jester from the Defense Protective Service and um, Doc Cook, who at the time was the head of the Washington Headquarters Services, which essentially manages the building. Um, nobody in the Pentagon leadership had any relationship with, local, with the local government. They didn't, I think it's safe to say, not pejoratively, but they didn't even really know a lot about how we function. And so they um, asked General Jackson because he oversees a number of installations like Fort McNair, Fort Myer, um, Fort Belvoir, you know, in Fairfax County, just to the south of the metropolitan area. And the, the, all of those installations do have relationships with the government, local governments that surround them. Um, in fact, the fire departments of those installations are all part of the automatic and mutual aid system that exists um, in the Northern Virginia area. So General Jackson um, had some experience, at least, you know, sitting at the table with locals, uh, maybe not frequently, but, you know, he had some understanding. Um, because there were so many resources, units, agencies um, that had showed up, as I said before, some requested, some not. I decided that I needed to convene a meeting um, to essentially establish uh, and communicate to everybody that was assisting us here how we were managing the incident. So I, I asked Chief Jester if he could get me a room. This was about two o'clock in the afternoon on the 11th. He came back a short time later and told me that he had secured the Secretary of Defense's um, press briefing room. Mm. And I could have it at six o'clock. And so six, at six o'clock, we convened um, what ostensibly were the heads of all of the agencies that were there, you know, um, assisting. Um, I started out by telling everybody that we had done a really good job for the first eight hours, but we were gonna be there for another eight days. And I explained to them what the incident command system was and asserted our responsibility as the Arlington County Fire Department to be the lead agency in managing the response. The FBI stood up and said that they um, were working with the fire department, but would take their direction from us. And at that moment, or at that time, General Jackson also stepped forward, introduced himself and said he had been assigned by the secretary to support our response with anything that the Department of Defense had. And what he said to me essentially was, if I have it and you need it, it's yours. Um, he then assigned two of his colonels to represent him in unified command, one for the day shift and one for the night shift. And then he and the then fire chief, Ed Plogger, um, you know, established a partnership that was just enormously um, beneficial to all of us. Um, and, I, you know, I can't speak highly enough of either Chief Plogger or General Jackson and the two of them together just were masterful in the work that they did. Such great coordination. I think this is uh, understated in that uh, what I took away from the book was that there was great coordination between the Department of Defense, the FBI, and the local and state fire departments, EMS. The, I, I really, because there's so many competing agencies, this is the fear that, uh, especially when I, in, when I uh, interview uh, former FBI agents who later turned out to be whistleblowers like Mark Rossini, um, Ken Williams of Phoenix, where they talk about competing agency between the CIA and the FBI and the NSA and the DIA, and there's this competing uh, attitude. 
this wasn't the case at the Pentagon. Was that, it was like a free flow? Was how it had to have been quite invaluable. So I have long attributed that to the fact that um, it, going back to the beginning of this story, when we talked about what Chris recognized through his study of Oklahoma City and the way that he built um, a partnership with us at the local level, again, in an area that the Bureau doesn't traditionally work with. I, I don't want to gloss over this. On the morning of September 11th, Chris was with all of the heavy rescue squads, most of the heavy rescue squads from the fire departments in the Washington metropolitan area who had all gathered at the DC Fire Training Academy. And what they were doing there was um, preparing for the work that they would be called on to do in October when we were anticipating the International Monetary Fund and World Bank meetings in DC. And if you go back and look, or if you recall, back in those days, those meetings brought with them a lot of protesters, anti-globalists, um, anarchists, people intent on um, disrupting, if not tearing down those institutions. And one of the tactics that those disruptors would use is to lock themselves in devices to block access to public roadways and buildings. And what Chris was doing was sharing with our rescue technicians who were going to be expected to extricate people from those devices to open up access to those roadways and buildings. Chris was sharing what he had by way of intelligence. You know, what are those devices? What could we expect when we encountered mm -hmm. them? So that understanding about the interdependencies, the, you know, Chris had the intel, but he didn't have the technical, the technical, technical means to do those extrications. And so we had those technical means, but not the intel. So, you know, working together, that recognition that, as I've been saying for 20 years now, when you are dealing with um, novel events, large scale events that are multidimensional, and that we have very little experience with, there isn't a profession or a jurisdiction that has all of the answers or has all of the resources or has all of the expertise. Yeah. It is about coming together and acknowledging that. And we were acknowledging that, again, based on this relationship building with Chris, as well as all of the police and fire departments in the metropolitan area, who again had been working together for decades. You know, just um, about a month ago, we had the anniversary of another event here in the Washington area, the 1982 Air Florida crash. A passenger jetliner uh, goes to take off from National Airport. It hasn't been properly de-iced. It actually hits the 14th Street Bridge before crashing into Potomac River. And the response to that incident was a debacle. There was no coordination among jurisdictions. Um, there was it's some open hostility uh, between jurisdictions. By the way, at the same time that that crash occurred, a subway train in an underground tunnel crashed into a wall killing four people. Ah. So the metropolitan area, you know, I refer to Air Florida as the bookend event with 9-11. In other words, we didn't, we didn't shine so well that day in January 1982. But we learned a lot from that. We invested a lot in that. And we recognized, even though we never envisioned something like a commercial airliner into the Pentagon, mm -hmm. We recognized that there were going to be points at which we were going to be dependent on each other. We were going to have to support each other. We were going to have to back each other up. And the last thing I'll say about this is that when we established from the first moments that effective working relationship, meaning the fire department and the FBI, and, and let me not skip over the fact that one of the first people that I met when I arrived 
at the Pentagon was John Jester, the chief of the yeah. Defense Protective Service. And John has no illusions, no misgivings about what I'm doing there. He knows exactly what I'm going to do. He knows exactly who's going to be in charge of this. Yes, he's in charge of law enforcement at the Pentagon, but this event totally exceeds his expertise and resources. And so he knows right away from that pre-established relationship what he can count on me for. That coming together, that um, some people will call it a command presence. Um, the fact that we had that in just the first moments, I think sent a powerful signal to everybody that this is how this is going to work. And we are not going to put up with efforts to tear this apart. I'm not gonna tell you that there weren't people that had different agendas, mm -hmm. right? We had, a, we had one particular case where a person who works for another, another federal agency that um, has little, if anything, to do with emergency response, but he declared at a certain point early in the response that because this was federal land, he was in charge. He was quickly escorted off the scene because he did not have any authority. He did not have an equity in terms of, um, you know, what we were contending with here. So it wasn't that there weren't some people making small efforts to, I, I can't even say they could be in the category of tearing it down. It wasn't that there wasn't, it wasn't that there was no friction because there was here and there, but we coalesced around how we were gonna manage this incident in a united way that um, just gave no space for those efforts. Yeah. We had people, um, coming from elsewhere in the country who did not recognize what we were doing by way of incident command. And they were quickly told, not by me, but by people many levels below me, this is the way it's going. If you don't like it, leave. This is the way this is going to be managed. It's done well for several days now. You know, get on board or leave. So there was something about the presence, the unified message that I think we conveyed um, that just tamped down a lot of whatever minuscule efforts, you know, people were trying to, um, you know, find a foothold with. On, by October 2nd, 2001, the search for evidence remains was complete and the site is turned over to the Pentagon. What did you end up doing immediately afterwards? Um, I started dealing with anthrax. Oh, is that right? Anthrax, the, the mailings to um, Florida occurred while we were still on the ground at the Pentagon. Um, but we began running, running white powder calls um, pretty substantially. And what, what happened with me was that um, to catch up on work that obviously had laid unattended to for the time I was at the Pentagon, I was in my office on a Saturday morning when um, some of my units ran a white powder call at the post office down the street from my office. Hmm. And I decided, well, let me walk down there and see how they're doing. And I did that. And when I got there, um, my cell phone rang and it was the assistant chief of the United States Capitol Police who I had worked with, with that specialized team that I mentioned earlier, who supported um, joint sessions of Congress at the Capitol like the State of the Union address and, and those sorts of things. And he said to me, um, hey, Jim, you might 
have seen on the news, we have a little bit of a problem going on up here on the hill. And I said, his name was Jim also. I said, yeah, yeah, Jim, I have. And he said, it's a real mess. Mm. We are not well organized at all. Will you come over here and set up incident command for us? And so I called my boss, the fire chief, and said, this is what they're asking for. Um, how do you feel about this? And he said, I'm okay with it. Just don't get too entangled. And so I spent the next three days at the Capitol um, essentially putting together their incident command structure um, and helping them in the early stages of some decision making, um, you know, before coming back um, to Arlington and trying to resume some sense of normalcy. For people not, and this is true certainly of New York too, but, I, and I think it's true of many areas of the country, but it's hard to describe for people what those first, I could say weeks and months, but quite frankly, it was a couple of years, were like um, waiting for the next shoe to drop, waiting for, you know, all of these things that we have done to get ready for a monstrous event like September 11th, or for that matter, anthrax. But what's next and how do we get ready? How do we continue to keep our people operating at a peak level? How do we take care of them and their families who've just been through life altering events? Um, it was a time of extraordinary work. Um, just not that we hadn't been doing that prior to 9-11, but it was just, um, when I think back to that right now, um, you know, there, there hasn't been a time in my life when I worked harder or more intensely. Has, it, has, has the events changed you in any way? You know, I get asked this question a lot. Um, and, you know, personally, um, you know, as close as I live to the Pentagon, um, what my wife um, had to do, she spirited our kids down to Southern Maryland to her parents' house um, so that they would be safe and so that she could go back to her job as a senior executive at the CIA. Um, there were a lot of pressures and, you know, maintaining an equilibrium was something that I think we both helped each other do in some really um, difficult circumstances. I think as importantly, I've spent a lot of years learning from these events um, so as to be able to share not just the experience, but the, the lessons, the meaningfulness um, of what we were able to accomplish. It's, it's unfortunate that we've had many events since then, not all of which, far too many of which have not um, been able to represent the same uh, level of success that we were able to do at the Pentagon. But, you know, when, when we first went to the county manager in Arlington and said, look, we're getting all kinds of requests to come tell this story. Mm. His reaction was not one of, well, we can't afford to do that. It, it was not one of, we have work to do here. His, his reaction being a professional public manager and a student of public administration, his immediate answer was, this is what we do. This is what we do. We have to give this back. We have to, we have to not just tell the story, but share with people what we've been through in a way that will enlighten to them, enlighten them, motivate them, 
hopefully to do the, the same thing, to make the same investments. Um, you know, the after action report that Ed Plogger walks into the command post on September 13th and he says, I want to do an after action report. And I looked at him like, are you kidding? I'm, I'm a little bit up to my neck in alligators here. And he said, no, if we don't start this now, we're going to lose too much. And he was right. He was right. And so we started, you know, pulling on the threads of data and, you know, started putting stuff together. Um, I've forgotten now, there's over 100, 120, 125 um, lessons learned in that after action report. And they're broken down by category. And Ron Carley, who was the county manager at the time, when that report was produced, he pulled together his public safety leadership team, the police chief, the fire chief, um, the, we, the, the emergency manager then was, the emergency management was a program in the fire department. Um, and he said, you have one year to address every one of these observations. I want a report in one year's time of everything that you've done to address. If it, if it was something you did well, I wanna know what you're doing to institutionalize it. If it's something that didn't go so well, I want to know the corrective action. Um, and sure enough, ap after a year, he, he required progress reports, but at the end of the year, we submitted to him a report that stated, this is what we've done to address every one of these uh, issues. And, you know, lots of after action reports get thrown up on a shelf right. and forgotten. Um, you know, lessons learned are only those that are later applied. And that's what Ron was trying to, you know, impress upon us that the, the, the system needs to function, the institutions need to function, and these things need to be um, incorporated into the way that you do your business. The one, probably one of the final questions I have, I probably wanted to, um, but, and I, it's unfortunate I have to ask this, but it's imperative. Uh, one of the many fringe conspiracy theories I've, we've come across over the years is the fact that Little evidence of airline debris was found at the Pentagon, such as why there were no large engines found, no whole bodies from the planes, uh, no people in the planes that were found, or no wings. What would you say to these people who make the statement that if there was a plane crash at the Pentagon, why there was no large piece of the plane recovered or whole bodies of the people on board the plane? Um, well, first I will tell you that um, in one experience that's still sears in my mind um there was all but a whole body found of one occupant of the airplane um and i won't go into any details out of respect for her and her family um as to the larger issue about the airplane um one you know we do have video evidence of the airplane as it approaches the building um, and strikes, uh, strikes the building. We have plenty of witnesses like myself who saw um, you know, the pieces of the airplane, including some fairly large pieces, um, substantial, um, if not whole engines, certainly most of uh, engines. Um, so, you know, for whatever it's worth, eyewitnesses to that history. Um, we've recorded it. We have, you know, our experiences to share. We were on the ground. We've seen those in many instances. We touched those artifacts. Um, you know, I think I would also just ask those who still have questions or more specifically those arguing a different scenario. Um, 
you really dishonor the loss of those 184 people and their families who have had to bear the weight of those losses for 20 years now and will for you know long into the future um, it was a tragic event that certainly represented um, the failure of government, our failure to protect the populace. Um, but that's where it ends. That's where it ends. It's not anything nefarious about the attack on the Pentagon um, was in the actions of those five hijackers that took that airplane into the building. Obviously part of the 19 that did all four planes, but the five that commandeered American Airlines Flight 77 and flew it into the airline, that was the only evil um, that occurred that day. Um, the rest was 184 innocent lives lost, you know, when they got on an airplane to go do um, something important in their lives. Arlington County Fire Chief and Incident Commander at the Pentagon, James Schwartz, thank you very much for coming on today.